What is infinity? What does it mean for there to be an infinite number of things? Well, infinity has been a subject in mathematics for a very long time. For example, consider Euclid. Euclid was a Greek mathematician in the 4th and 3rd centuries BC. He made great strides in geometry and thus much of elementary geometry we learn is named after him. However, he made strides in other branches of mathematics as well, including number theory. One of his proofs demonstrated that there are an infinite number of primes. Consider some finite list of primes, p1, p2, p3, and so on. Then, consider a number p is equal to p1 times p2 times p3, all the way to pn plus 1. Now, since all numbers have their own unique prime factorization, there must be a prime number q that divides p. However, this prime number q cannot be any of the prime numbers p1, p2, p3 in our finite list. Why? Well, if it was, then q divides p1 times p2 times p3, and it also divides p. Then that means q should also divide the difference, p minus p1 times p2 times p3, but that difference is simply 1. No prime number divides 1, so q cannot be in our list of primes. We defined a prime number outside of our finite list. Thus, for any finite list of primes, there exists some prime number outside that finite list. Now, the ancient Greeks did not have our modern-day notion of infinity. Thus, Euclid simply concluded that, quote, prime numbers are more than any assigned multitude of prime numbers. However, we now know that this means that there are an infinite number of prime numbers. Now, infinity is pretty big. If we counted each prime number, 2, 3, 5, 7, it would go on forever. Yet, in the branch of set theory, there exists an infinity much bigger. So big, we cannot count them like we did with the primes. Uncountable infinity. Now, at first, this may sound absurd. I mean, infinity is infinity. It's unending. You can't just compare sizes of infinite things, right? To tackle this question, first, we're going to have to go through some basic set theory. So, a set is just a collection of elements. The cardinality of a set is the measure of how many elements it has. For example, the cardinality of the set A equals 1, 2, 3 is 3. There's three elements, so the cardinality is 3. The cardinality of the set of the days of the week would be 7. Now, we can extend this idea for infinite sets, like the set of all natural numbers, for example. We actually have a symbol for the cardinality of the set of all naturals, aleph null. So, how do we determine that two infinite sets have the same cardinality, that is, they're the same size? We define something called a bijection. A bijection from one set to another is a function such that each member of one set is assigned to a different member of the other set, and no member of the other set is left without an assignment from the first set. Now, I know it sounds a bit complicated, but it's actually quite simple. For example, if we have a set B equals 4, 5, 6, I can prove that A and B have the same size by showing a one-to-one -one correspondence between these two sets. That is, we're showing a bijection. As long as each element of one set matches with one of the other set, and there's nothing left over, we define a bijection. And we can safely say that the two sets have the same cardinality. More analytically, we can define a function that corresponds to these elements. Maybe some x in set A can correspond to some x plus 3 in set B. Since we know that every x will match with every x plus 3, with none left over from either the domain or the image, we define a bijection. We can quite easily do this with infinite sets. For example, we may think that the set of natural numbers has more stuff than the set of even naturals. I mean, after all, all the odd naturals are missing from the set of all even naturals. And sure, the set of natural numbers may be denser, but they're actually the same size. We can easily define a bijection. Maybe every x in the set of natural numbers can correspond with every 2x in the set of even naturals. In doing so, we will pair every natural number with every even natural number, with no remainder. We can go on to even define bijections between the naturals and the rationals, using a zigzag pattern to assign a natural number to a rational number with no rationals left over. Again, this may seem counterintuitive at first, since the rationals are so densely populated along the number line. 
but as long as we define a bijection, we know that they have the same cardinality. The cardinality of these sets, the set of natural numbers, prime numbers, rationals, is called countable infinity. In the realm of infinite sets, countable sets do not have that great of an impact. Consider the no countable difference principle that states that the cardinality of any infinite set, S, is equal to the cardinality of the union of S and a countable set, let's say A. For S to be infinite, its cardinality has to be at least that of the naturals, and for A to be countable, its cardinality has to be at most that of the naturals. So what this principle means is, as long as a set is infinite, adding more stuff will not change its size if you're adding a countable number of stuff. For example, we can add the set of negative integers to the set of naturals to form the set of all integers. But since the set of naturals is infinite, and the set of negative integers is countable, we can see that the set of integers has the same cardinality as a set of naturals. So, simply adding a countable amount of stuff is not going to make our infinite sets any bigger. Are there any other ways to make a set bigger? Yes. It's called a power set. The power set of a set is a set of all subsets of that set. For example, the power set of the set 1, 2, 3 contains the sets 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, and the empty set. The power set of a set has much more elements than the original set. In fact, according to Cantor's theorem, a set always has more subsets than it has members. So then, what's the power set of the naturals? Well, there are a lot of subsets of the naturals. The set 1, 2, 3 is a subset. The set 7, 9, 134 is a subset. The set of all primes is a subset. Well, if we can just define a bijection, then we know that the power set of the naturals has the same cardinality as a set of all naturals. In fact, let's just say we did find some bijective function between the two sets. Then we can name each element in the power set, which are just subsets of the naturals, let's say S1, S2, S3, and so on. Now, we can make a table where we have each subset, and we can note if each subset contains the corresponding natural with a Y for yes, if it does, and an N for no, if it doesn't. Now, consider a new set S of natural numbers defined in a very specific way. For each natural number N, if S of N does not contain N, then add N to this new set. What this process does is it makes sure our new set is different to every countably infinite subsets S1, S2, S3, and so on. So we began with the assumption that the power set of the naturals has a bijection with the naturals. But we found that this is not true. We can always define a new subset of the naturals that is not contained within our countably infinite set. There isn't a one-to-one -one correspondence, so the power set of the naturals must have a greater cardinality. Now, if this line of logic is difficult, it's similar to Euclid's proof of infinite primes. For that proof, he considered any finite set of primes and deduced that there must be at least one prime that was not in that finite set. Since no finite set contains all prime numbers, prime numbers must be infinite. Similarly, this argument considers any countably infinite list of subsets of the naturals, and deduces that there must be at least one subset of the naturals that is not in the countable set. Since no countably infinite set contains all the subset of the naturals, the subset of the naturals must be uncountable. Thus, we leave the realm of countability and discover our first uncountable set. This uncountable set is denoted 2 to the aleph null. But are there any other sets with this uncountable cardinality? Think back to when we discussed the set of all rational numbers. Even if the rational numbers are infinitely dense, they still have the same cardinality as the natural numbers. But what if we took it a step further? What if we wanted the cardinality of the real numbers? Now, instead of talking about the entire real number line, let's begin with the unit interval just the numbers between 0 and 1. Now let's try to define a bijection between the unit interval and every natural number. Since we can't just order the real numbers from least to greatest, we can randomly assign every real number between 0 and 1 to a natural number. Now let's define a new real number, r. Consider this diagonal of numbers, which contains the first digit of the first number, then the second digit of the second number, and so on. We can use this diagonal of numbers to make our new real number, but with a few changes. 
If the number is not zero, then we change it to zero. And if the number is zero, we change it to one. Does this process look a bit familiar? It's pretty much the same argument we use to prove the uncountability of the power set of the naturals, going down a diagonal and changing it to make sure that it is different from every entry is exactly what we did with the list of the subset of the naturals. This kind of argument is called Cantor's diagonal argument. And again, this new real number r we made is different from every real number on our countably infinite list of real numbers. Thus, we fail to define a bijection, and our set of real numbers in the unit interval is uncountably infinite. Now, since the unit interval is a subset of all real numbers, we can also deduce that all real numbers are also uncountable. If you're curious, by the way, the cardinality of the real numbers is the same as the cardinality of the unit interval. Check out this short video for a proof if you want. Now, let's shift our eyes to something a bit unexpected. Functions. Specifically, how a function grows. For example, let's define a function with natural number inputs, f of x is equal to x. Then its sequence of values is 1, 2, 3, 4, pretty straightforward. However, consider g of x is equal to x squared. This function grows, 1, 4, 9, 16, grows much faster than f of x. In fact, we can see that g of x over f of x is equal to x. So as x tends to infinity, so does g of x over f of x. In this way, we can say that g of x grows faster than f of x. So, what does this have to do with cardinality and infinity? Well, consider any countably infinite list of positive integer functions, f1, f2, f3, and so on. A mathematician by the name of Dubois Raymond conjured an interesting observation regarding these functions. First, we know that f1 of n plus f2 of n plus f3 of n all the way to fn of n is greater than fi of n for every i is less than or equal to n, since all function values are positive. I mean, this makes complete sense since every fi of n for i is less than or equal to n is in this sum. We have f of n here, f of n minus 1 here, and so on, all the way to f of 1. In fact, let's just define this entire sum with a new function, f of n. So, we actually have f of n is greater than or equal to f i of n for all n is greater than i. In other words, f of n grows at least as fast as any function f of i. So then consider a new function, d of n is equal to n times f of n. Well, then we know that d of n grows faster than f of n, since d of n over f of n goes to infinity as n goes to infinity. Therefore, our function d grows faster than any function in our infinite list. In other words, for any list of positive integer functions, f1, f2, f3, and so on, such that the list is countable, there exists a function, d of n, not in that list, since d of n grows faster than every function on that list. The set of all positive integer functions is uncountable. You can't define a bijection with the natural numbers. And here, we can kind of see an earlier example of a diagonal argument. The function, f of n, is the sum of the entries in or above the diagonal in the table of our countably infinite number of functions. So, we have arrived at three different uncountable sets. The power set of the naturals, the set of real numbers, and the set of positive integer functions. But, do these three sets have the same cardinality? I mean, we know it's uncountable, we know it's greater than the cardinality of the naturals, but are they equal? After all, if you just describe these sets, you know, a power set, real numbers, integer functions, well, they don't seem related. But one clue might be the diagonal methods of how we prove their uncountable nature. Maybe there are connections in these seemingly different sets. Remember, all we need to do is define a bijection. Is there any way to do that with these three sets? To answer that question, let's talk about binary. Binary, or base 2 notation, just uses 0 and 1 to describe numbers. There's different ways to think about binary, but I like thinking of the digits of binary numbers as sums of powers of 2. Let me explain. To convert from our base 10 system to binary, you can imagine a sequence of all the powers of 2, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3, and so on. Now, you can describe every natural number as a sum of powers of 2. Why? Well, let's say we could describe every natural number up to 2 to the n using only powers of 2. Well, the next power of 2, 2 to the n plus 1, is just 2 times 2 to the n. So any number between 2 to the n and 2 to the n plus 1 
can be simply written as 2 to the n plus any natural number before 2 to the n, which we have already assumed is definable by sums of powers of 2. In other words, if we can describe any number below 2 to the n as sums of powers of 2, we can also describe any number below 2 to the n plus 1 as sums of powers of 2. Well, we can define 2 to the 0 as a sum of powers of 2, which is just very trivially 2 to the 0. So that means we can describe numbers below 2 to the 1 as sums of powers of 2, which again is very trivial. And so we can do the same with numbers below 2 to the 2, and then 2 to the 3, and 2 to the 4, and so on. This method of proof, by the way, is called proof by induction. Anyways, we know that every natural number can be described by a sum of powers of 2. So to convert a number to binary, we just see what powers of 2 add up to that number. We can then write a sequence of numbers parallel to the powers of 2, where if we use that power of 2 in our sum, we put 1, and else we put 0. This results in the binary notation for that natural number. Now, I like this method because it allows us to talk about non-natural numbers in binary. After all, we can have negative powers of 2. 2 to the negative 1 is 1 half, 2 to the negative 2 is 1 fourth, and so on. And as it turns out, all real numbers can be turned into binary, since any real number can be described by a finite or infinite sum of these powers of 2. Here's a nice illustration for this. Take a number between 0 and 1. To find its binary expansion, first we write 0 point to denote that this is in the decimals. Then we draw a line in the middle of the unit interval. If this number is to the left of our line, write 0. If it's to the right, write 1. Then go to the half that contains the number, draw another line in the middle of that half, and continue this process. After an infinite process, we will be able to describe every real number with just zeros and ones. Perfect. Except for one small detail. You see, some real numbers fall right on the lines of bisection. For example, consider one half. That lies right on the middle. If we assign one half to be on the left subinterval, writing a zero, then the rest of the process will have our number on the right of the bisections, thus resulting in an infinite string of ones. If we assign one half to be on the right subinterval, writing a 1, then we'll have an infinite string of zeros, since one half will always be on the left. In general, since any multiple of a power of 2 will eventually fall in a line of bisection, these values, p over 2 to the q, will result in two different binary expansions every time. But for now, let's brush that aside. We'll come back to it later. The point is, we can describe every real number between 0 and 1 using a sequence of zeros and ones. And on the flip side, every sequence of zeros and ones will result in a unique real number, barring the ambiguous cases that we have found. With this, we can finally talk about infinity. After all, we did all this binary stuff, but what's the point? Well, using binary, we were able to connect every real number between zero and one to a sequence of zeros and ones. Well, do you remember how we described the power set of the natural numbers? We described them with the sequences of yeses and nos depending on which natural number the set contains. Well, if we just replace the yeses with ones and nos with zeros, then we have every sequence of zeros and ones. And we already showed that every sequence of zeros and ones can be described uniquely by a real number. And every real number can be described by a unique sequence of zeros and ones. We found the bijection. Well, except for the ambiguous cases, those aren't uniquely described by a sequence of zeros and ones. But these cases exist only for numbers of the form p over 2 to the q. Well, that's just a rational number. Sure, it's an infinite number of rational numbers, but we know that the set of all rationals is countable. And according to our no countable different principle, adding a countably infinite number of things doesn't change the cardinality of an infinite set. So these ambiguous cases don't matter. The cardinality of the set of all real numbers is the same as the cardinality of the power set of the naturals. So then, how about the set of positive integer functions? Well, consider any integer function f. You can write down its infinite sequence, like so. Then, we can write a sequence of zeros and ones, like this. For each function value, f of n, write f of n minus one number of ones, and then write a zero. We can do this for every function value for an infinite sequence of zeros and ones. Again, every function sequence results in a unique sequence of zeros and ones. Conversely, every sequence of zeros and ones encodes its own unique sequence of integers, which results in the function values of a unique function. Well, 
except for the infinite sequences of zeros and ones that end with an infinite string of ones. These can't be turned into a function sequence since that essentially means that the values of the function terminate, which isn't possible because a function has an infinite number of outputs. But that's okay, because we know that there are a countably infinite number of these. Why? Well, an infinite string of ones only appear when we have one of those ambiguous cases, when a rational number of the form p over 2 to the q is being converted to binary. So we can ignore these specific sequences of zeros and ones since they're countable. So we have defined a bijection between the set of integer functions and these infinite sequences of zeros and ones, which we know have the same cardinality as a set of real numbers and the power set of the naturals. Therefore, the power set of the naturals the set of real numbers, and the set of integer functions all have the same cardinality. Sometimes, infinite sets, uncountable infinity, cardinality, these things seem strange to even discuss. Most people question the legitimacy of a statement regarding bigger sets of infinity. But the math is there. These three distinct sets can be shown that they are uncountably large, yet the same size. This cardinality is called the cardinality of the continuum, named after the continuum of real numbers. Yet, as we've discovered, it's so much more than that. I mean, there are bigger cardinalities, bigger Aleph numbers, and power sets describe bigger and bigger uncountable sets. But don't let that diminish the beauty and the elegance of the cardinality of the continuum. These sets are so big, we literally can't fit their elements in an infinite list. Maybe there's no real applications for these concepts. Maybe we can't solve problems in physics or medicine with something like the power set of the naturals. But it doesn't need to. The fact that we can talk and conjecture and prove and study these ideas, these astonishing, intense, infinite concepts, shows that our curiosity, our logic, it's not bound by simply applications in the physical world. It surpasses that. It literally goes beyond what we can count. Thanks for watching.